Greetings. My name is Claire Johnson Allen. I am the Associate Director here in the Women's Center at Boston College. I am also an MSW graduate of the class of 2007, also here from BC. I have been asked to speak with you uh, as a continuation in the Preaching from Sister Thea's Kitchen uh, series, and I'm very humbled uh, to be able to be here and share some thoughts uh, with you all today. With that being said, I'd like for us to start with a proverb. So this is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27, which says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. One way that that has been taken, and that's the base for what I hope to be able to speak with you about today is this, which is that when you have the ability and the opportunity, and I would even add the privilege to be able to help someone, that it is of utmost importance that you do so. We cannot solve the world's problems individually, but individually, we can be a positive force in the lives of those that we encounter. So as lofty as that can be, I really feel that that proverb ties so well into what Ignatius saw as our responsibility to use our education and our knowledge to be of service to other people and to truly be people for others. And it was in reading about St. Ignatius and his thoughts that I was able to have a really amazing experience that for me very much informed what my lane is and what my gifts are. So I invite you as I share my story to think for yourself, what are your gifts? What is your lane? And how is it that you can use those gifts in that lane to help your fellow man, to help your fellow person as it relates to issues of racial justice, social justice, any injustice that we are so obviously seeing day in and day out in the world today. I want to rewind back to my first year in graduate school where I'd come into BC, was really excited to be here, School of Social Work, and I was presented with the opportunity to go on a Christian pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And I went and I was one of two black students on the trip out of about 20 students. I was also one of two graduate students. The other students on the trip were undergraduates. And we traveled for 14 days. We landed in Tel Aviv. We spent several days inside the old city, inside Jerusalem in the Armenian quarter. We then went to Palestine and spent time doing homestay in Bayit Sohor, which is a suburb um, of Bethlehem. We had the opportunity to go to the caves of Qumran at Jericho. We had the opportunity to then make our way back down to Jerusalem um, and stayed outside the city before we headed home. And while we were on that trip, there were several instances that particularly stood out to me. And one of which was we got stopped while we were on a bus, we were traveling. And we got stopped on a bus. 
And one of the reasons why we got stopped was because it was a larger bus. And once the soldiers boarded the bus and saw that there were two black students on the bus, they detained us. Everybody had to present their passports, their US passports. Eventually, we were allowed to continue along our way, but I would be lying if I didn't say that my heart wasn't pounding during that encounter. There was another point where we were on the road in, um, in Jerusalem, and we had, we, we observed, um, a person who was of my complexion, who from where we stood, it seemed was being accosted um, by soldiers. And we stopped and, and we decided to bear witness to what we were seeing. And once we did that, the soldiers effectively moved this person into an alley so we could no longer see them. And everywhere we went, Myself and this other black student often got very strange looks because we were two black students in with a group of 18 other white students in a place that is notorious for having issues of uh, race that are very similar to ours here in the United States. It's a very sobering experience for me to realize that one of the few things that separated me from the person who was taken down the alley was indeed my US citizenship and my passport. And I, again, would be lying if I didn't tell you that I wasn't clutching that as tight as I could. And even throughout this trip, as we witnessed these different levels of injustices and however remotely removed I felt from them or they seemed to me at the time, I was still seeking spirituality. I was still seeking God. I was still looking for an experience that was going to really validate why I went on this trip and why this place was so holy and why this place was so special. And I looked high, I looked low, left, right, down, round. I looked everywhere into every trip we went on, every person we got to interact with. And we came to a hostel just outside of the Sea of Galilee. And we had had a very full day. We had had Bishop Shaw, um, who's an Episcopal bishop, traveling with us. And he had done a confirmation and um, reaffirmation ceremony by the sea. It was beautiful. I wanted to feel called to be reaffirmed and I didn't feel it and was very disappointed. We went back to the hostel to take a breather for, before we met up for dinner for the day. And I remember hearing other students on the trip who were talking about the transformative spiritual experiences that they were having that they had gone out to the maze and were, and were walking around and had this chant that was put on their heart or that they had been reading scripture and had had some other sort of revelation. And I really began to feel like I was sitting in a pew and everybody was getting the Holy Spirit and then it got to me, skipped over me and continued on down the road. <laughs> because I took the time that we had at the hostel to check my email, send a message to my parents, let them know how I was doing, that I was okay, what we had done. And I remember really just feeling like something was wrong with me, that I wasn't having these experiences that my trip mates were having. And part of me was wondering if it was because I had been particularly aware of racial differences and injustices as we were traveling. And I also remember having this moment when I had pretty much given up. 
and I resigned myself to the fact that, okay, I'm not gonna have some sort of spiritual divine awakening on this trip. It's just a tourism trip. I'm gonna enjoy seeing the sights and maybe something will come later, who knows. After I sent that last email, I was approached by one of the chaplains on the trip, uh, Reverend Amy McCreeth. And she asked me how I was doing. And I said the usual, oh, I'm fine. She didn't believe me. And she said to me, no, how are you doing? I'm fine. I'm good. She still didn't believe me. And instead, she said, let's talk. We go away from the computer, grab a cup of tea, and we sit down. And she starts saying to me, how has this trip been for you? And so I told her that it had been difficult to see people who looked like me be accosted openly, that I would figure that in feeling that way in a place that is said to have so much spirituality and so much faith that I would be able to more easily find comfort in our faith um, to help me get through and sift through everything that I was feeling and that it wasn't happening and that I felt probably more disconnected from my faith in a place where it was given its life than I'd probably ever felt in all of my early 20-ish years <laughs> on that trip. And she said to me, did it ever occur to you that you're not on this trip for you? And I sat there a little confused and then a little angry because in my head I'm thinking, well, how am I not on this trip for me? This is a Christian pilgrimage. And when we go on our pilgrimage, it's kind of about us and our relationship. How is this not about me? And she said, did it ever occur to you that you are on this trip for others? And I took a step back and I asked her to expand on what she meant by that. And she said, I know that you yourself are focused on these larger pictures and these larger experiences. She said, but I've observed how you have interacted with your other trip mates. And I've overheard some of the really heavy, important conversations that you've had relating to mental health or eating disorders or being stressed out or just being a black person in this world at this time. She said, and you speak about it to it in ways that I don't think your trip mates have heard of before, but also she said, you're able to connect with them in a way that I don't know if you can see, but I can see that it's resonating. And did it ever occur to you that that's why you're here? That you're here to connect with people in the way that only you can, and that you're here to share your story in a way that only you can because they need to hear it. Did it ever occur to you that that connection is your gift and that's how God is working through you? And that really for me was my aha moment, that was my light bulb. That was, for lack of a better term, the proverbial floodgates just opening and me starting to understand that that was my lane. 
And that was my gift, to be able to connect with people, to be able to offer people a space where they can be safe and supported and ask difficult questions and sit with difficult thoughts and experiences and to be able to walk with them through that is not an easy thing for many people, but for me, I find it to be something that's very humbling and I find it to be something that I know is what I'm here to be able to do. And so coming back from that trip and finishing my studies and now being a licensed independent clinical social worker in the times that we're in has really been a point where I might have difficult days and I might have difficult times, but I don't have a difficult career because I'm using my gifts and I'm within my lane. With all of the things that are going on today, think of just one thing that comes to your mind that is different or challenging um, on lots of levels, right? International levels, national levels, community levels, personal levels. We all have the ability to fight for change. And we all have different ways and different skills and different gifts with which to be able to fight for change. I haven't been to any protests. They make me nervous. But I also realize that that's not my lane. My lane is being able to sit with people and process through what it might have been like to be at a protest or what it might have been like to sit with a friend who is telling them their experience of any sort of bigotry for the first time. I have friends who are writers and that's their lane. And so they write and they write and they write about what their experiences are with privilege and how they've been able to grow and change and learn and how the pen essentially is their sword. I have friends who are artists. That's why I'm on a stage. I dance, I sing, I perform, I've been doing it since I was a child. Art is another place that can really be sacred, that can show us reflections of ourselves, that can fight for change. I ask you to think about Proverbs. Think about St. Ignatius. Think about how you can leave your mark. No one is saying it has to be big. But everyone is saying it is important because you are a human being who exists on this earth. And with that, I do want to bring one final thought from our dear sister Thea Bowman, who shared, maybe I'm not making big changes in the world, but if I have somehow helped or encouraged somebody along the journey, then I've done what I'm called to do.